Dr. Johanna Olson. I'm the medical director for the Center for Trans Youth Health and Development at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We have the largest trans youth clinic in the world with about 250 active patients and about 50 more that are on the waiting list waiting to get in. Our youth um, vary in age. They range from four years old up to 25 when we sadly have to transition them to adult services. So when we talk about young people who identify as transgender, sometimes they're identifying that for themselves and sometimes other people are identifying that for them. What we are talking about are those young people who have a gender identity, their internal sense of maleness, femaleness, neither, both, being different than the gender that they were assigned at birth based on their anatomy. So one of the common things that happens is people have trouble differentiating between sexual orientation and gender identity. This is kind of the way that I like to think about it. Your gender identity is how you feel inside about yourself. It's how what you want to show to the world. When the world looks at you, what do you want them to see? How are you going to wear your gender? Do you want people to see a boy? Do you want people to see a girl? Do you want people to see something in between or neither of those things? Sexual orientation is about who you want to be with, who are you romantically attracted to, who are you sexually attracted to, at the end of the day, who are you going to be going home with. So the most common question that people ask is, how do you know that this is real? How do you know that someone truly has a gender identity that's different from their assigned one? versus a kid who really just wants to do things that we have decided as a society go with the other gender or another gender. So I get asked this question all the time. And the answer is that in early childhood, when all we have to go on is behavior, it's incredibly difficult to know. We know that when we talk to people who identify as gay or lesbian as adults, they had a lot of cross-gender activity when they were young. So that's not an uncommon thing that people go through. Um, but there are some differences in these kids and some of the things that the research has panned out on about is I will tell you they go like this some kids very very strongly absolutely have to live in their authentic gender role so they don't want to go to school living a lie is how they feel about it I can't go to school as a boy because it's a lie I can't go to school as a girl because it's a lie for me. And that's very, very uncomfortable for me. And those young people often will push for a social transition. So it's easiest to think about the phases of transition um, like this, reversible, partially reversible, and irreversible. Transition means when a young person is going through the process to bring their body into closer alignment with their internal gender identity. The reversible pieces of transition come with clothing, they come with hair, maybe you change your name, change your pronouns. These are all things that obviously you can reverse. You can always cut your hair, you can always grow your hair out, you can always change what clothes you wear. These are the reversible pieces and we call those social transition. Um, that is for a, a young person of any age, that would be the first step in transition. Now, there are some people that don't do the social transition piece until they've been on therapy, medical therapy for a while. They're usually older. But for younger kids, kids who are socially transitioning in childhood, they're not going to need to do any medical intervention until they start their puberty that their body would have started. There's a lot of good research that shows us people know their gender identity from a very young age, probably around three to five years old. The youngest that I've ever heard somebody express their gender identity being different than their assigned gender is 18 months old. This was a young kid who um, was born with a girl type body, was assigned a female gender, and at the age of 18 months said to their mom, I a boy. So this, this is not the first time I've heard of this, and so usually this expression comes very early in life. Little kids with gender identities that are different from their assigned ones have a couple of different ways that they can articulate this. Some kids are incredibly strong about it. They recognize there's a difference between their assigned gender and their internal gender identity, and they can talk about it in that way. I am a boy. I am a girl. 
And these are the things that I like to do. Stop taking me down the pink aisle at Toys R Us, or I really want to um, play sports, or something like that. Alternatively, an assigned male, somebody born with male body parts, that kid may say, I, I'm a girl. I want to wear a girl's bathing suit. I want to wear a girl's underwear. I want to play with girls' toys. Trans kids do this in the same way that non-trans kids do this. They just like what they like, and that's what they want to do. And so some kids have an environment where they're able to do that. They can talk to their parents about it and say, this doesn't feel right for me, or however a little three-year-old might say that, and their parent might explore that with them and say, you can play with whatever you want to play with. The fact that we gender toys anyway is kind of absurd. But they might be in an environment where their parent might say, no, you have a penis, you're a boy, and you're going to do boys' things, and I don't want to talk any more about girls' things. Those environments change the way that kids are able to express their gender. So for kids who are not supported, that these kids sometimes get subjected to somebody wanting to change their gender identity. So let's take you to a therapist that's going to beat this out of you or shock this out of you or make us ignore this out of you or a coach that's going to tell you to man up or some form of that is that actually still practiced in this country. That doesn't work. It not only doesn't work, but it's extremely harmful for young people. And it ends up, we have young people who are in really bad shape later on if that happens to them. This experience is different for people who are assigned male genders and people who are assigned female genders. So let's think about this. If you think that you have a son, you have a baby that was born with male parts, the doctor said it's a boy, and you're starting to raise your child as a boy, and your child comes in saying, I want to paint my nails, or I want to wear a dress, or I want to wear a girl's bathing suit. It's going to set up alarm bells for people in a different way than if your girl comes in and tells you, I want to wear pants or I want to do sports. We think about that differently in our society, which is why a lot of times in the medical and professional community, we see trans girls or assigned males much earlier than assigned females who identify as male. The first thing that a lot of people do is panic. So my kid comes in, they tell me that they're a different gender, I can't really wrap my head around this, so I'm going to engage the services of usually a mental health professional, probably a psychiatrist. So the middle road is kind of this wait and see approach. It's like, let's sort of push a gender neutral agenda onto our kid in childhood. So there's a lot of options, right? Oh, maybe we can get my kid to like animals. Maybe we can get my kid to like music. So this may be an attempt to sort of steer them away or kind of direct them away from more gender binary type of toys and activities. The third way is really for a caregiver family situation that helps a young person explore what they're going through with their gender. This isn't necessarily an easy thing for young people, especially as they get older and they're starting to get the cultural messages that who they are, how they feel inside is not right. And that is the predominant message that we give as a society. So another exciting thing that's happened over the last decade is that the Dutch, the Netherlands, who have done most of the work with gender and youth over the past 30 years, figured out that if you could not go through the process of the wrong puberty, that you could transition a lot easier than if you had gone through the wrong puberty for your gender identity. So what the Dutch brought us is a protocol that includes the use of medications that halt the body's puberty process. What's exciting about that is that as a young person starts to go through the wrong puberty and it causes them this tremendous amount of distress, they can put that on hold. They can put that on hold for a couple of years while they're able to work with a mental health therapist to kind of explore what it's going to mean to use hormones to go through a different puberty or the puberty that's right for that young person. One of the things that's extremely distressing for transgender youth is the development of secondary sexual characteristics. If you are assigned male and you start to develop things that, that boys go through in puberty that make them men, 
it's very distressing if you identify as female. So in other words, if you start to get facial hair, body hair, you start to get a male skeleton, your genitals start getting bigger, this is a time that is very, very precarious for these youth. It's a time when we see a heightened amount of bad behavior. We see sometimes very maladaptive coping with drugs, uh, maybe uh, high-risk sexual behavior, um, acting out at school, um, suicide. These, this is a very, very scary time for us as providers, family members, and especially for the young person themselves. So being able to block that process with these medications is extremely beneficial. It doesn't necessarily close that gap for them or alleviate their dysphoria, but it allows them the peace of mind that they're not going to go through and get an adult version of a body that already they don't feel connected to. So using blockers has another advantage. It's a completely reversible intervention. So if you put a young person on blockers at the beginning of puberty and then you take it off later, they will go through the puberty that corresponds to their gonads, either their testicles or their ovaries. If that young person wants to continue on taking hormones that correspond to their gender identity or cross-sex hormones, then they can go on to those and go through an appropriate puberty for them. So transgender youth that are in the juvenile justice system need to have appropriate medical care and it needs to be competent. So that means the physicians and other health care providers that work within that system either need to know how to do the care themselves or they need to be able to find outside providers who can do that care. Custodial staff have a very important role to play with transgender youth as well. Um, the environment that trans youth exist in is incredibly important for their health and well-being. Custodial staff can be very important in using appropriate names, pronouns. These are the things that the young person themselves identifies as works and is right for them. It's, it, when it comes to housing, which is one of the more difficult questions in the juvenile justice system, it really is going to take a village. There, the young person needs to be um, consulted when it comes to where they feel the safest and where they feel the most comfortable. And so they are the authority on where they should be housed. A lot of things go into that decision-making process, but it, excluding the young person from that decision would be a mistake.